The first reading is from the book of Samuel, Sam, 2 Samuel, chapter 23, beginning at the first verse. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favourite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, Ruling in the fear of God is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on the cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them with uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 132, verse 1 to 12, and we'll say alternate verses. Lord, remember David and all his trouble, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter the shelter of my house, nor hide into the comfort of my head. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. Lo, we heard of it at Apra. We found it in the fields of Jarrah. Let us go to the place of his Let us fall on our knees before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into our resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your faithful ones shout for joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed. One who is the fruit of your body, I was set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and the commands which I teach them, their children also shall sit upon your throne forever. You're just reading this from Revelations chapter 1, beginning at the fourth verse. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the king, kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be in a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. God is who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 18, beginning at the 33rd verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own? What did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? 
Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. My followers, if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So friends, today is the feast day of Christ the King. Funny story, true story. Um, When I was just entering seminary, uh, I had a, uh, a lecturer, very high Anglo Catholic lecturer. He said, Oh, um, you're coming to join us, obviously, in the chapel for communion, uh, oh, mass, I think she said, um, today. I said, Yeah, of course. She said, It's the feast day of such and such. I thought, Oh, great. You must be having the Eucharist and then like having a big meal together or something. So I went <laughs> to, to the, the chapel expecting all of this, and it was, it was the Eucharist with a few different prayers, and I was really surprised. So, no, we're not having a big feast together, but it is a feast day today, which is wonderful. I've always had an issue with, well, I, I used to have an issue with Christ the King. And uh, when I was first taught this feast day, I kind of uh, said in a fairly facetious way, which is very unlike me, I don't like to stir the pot, uh, that I think the first reading for Christ the King should be this one. This is from John uh, chapter 6. Verse 12, when they were satisfied, he told, uh, sorry, when they, yes, when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over uh, so that nothing may be lost. So they gather them up and from the fragments of the five barley loaves they left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized they were about to take him by force and make him king, he withdrew to the mountains. Jesus never wanted to be king. He ran away from being made king. We see that in the scriptures. When Pilate directly questions Jesus about being king, It's a bit of a clue into Jesus' personality. He sometimes liked to give answers and things that may have stirred the pot a little bit. He said, you say that I am king. And yet we celebrate Christ the king. That's initially why I was really uneasy about celebrating this feast day. Uh, I read Pope Pius XI's encyclical, encyclical, which is the guy who uh, inaugurated this day, right, of course. Uh, And if you'd like, I'll read the entire thing to you now, word for word, if you'd like to hear that. No? Okay. I'll I'll, I'll stop you from that one. But when I read that encyclical, then it gave me a little bit of a clue as to why this day should actually still be observed. Uh, Pope Pius was very, very clear in his encyclical that we proclaim Christ as King quite precisely because it is nothing like the kingship of this world. Nothing like it. Something completely different. He wrote about the poor and how they were neglected. He wrote about those who were dispossessed and how Jesus is with them. He wrote about how Christ went to the cross as an outlaw, as somebody turned out of his own religion and turned that cross into a place of forgiveness and new life turned death into promise of everlasting life. And this is the type of kingship that we proclaim uh, as Christ. But it's very easy for us to misunderstand what these things mean. 
It's very easy for us to proclaim Christ as king and immediately think of a worldly king. Or maybe today of a president. Or even more so today, people that have more power than presidents, somebody who's a CEO of a very powerful corporation, who control the decisions that a lot of those political leaders make. If we are thinking of that sort of power when we're thinking of Jesus, we're getting it wrong. So I've been doing a little bit of research again on when the word Christian was first used. So I think we all have a fairly decent understanding of what we mean by Christian in the modern world when we say it. It it may vary a little bit, but we kind of all, correct me if I'm wrong, have have the idea that it's, it's someone who follows Christ, somebody who belongs to the religion that Christ inaugurated sort of thing loosely very loosely but I I think that's fair to say that kind of encompasses we don't bother about the creeds much when we think about that or or thinking of the trinity or anything it's just someone who follows a Christian religion the first time the word Christian comes about is mid-second century right so we've got a good at least 150 years at least of Jesus followers uh, probably a lot more than that but if we're being very conservative um without the word Christian. But even when the word Christian is used, today we misunderstand its power. And that's why in Acts, when Paul is asking one of the Roman leaders, are you Christian, which isn't actually the word we think of it today, it holds a lot more power than what we think when we read it. We think, you know, have you converted to this new religion? But when it was translated into Greek, we know what, what Christ, Christos, means. The anointed, right? one anointed with holy oil. And that sort of ian at the end of it, you had uh, people who were um, Platians, you had people who were um, Aristotelians, all of this kind of thing, right? So what that meant is of the party of these people so they belong to that way of thinking and they agree with their the way that they shape the world right so that's what christian meant so put those two things together remember jesus crucified by rome Uh, rome had a very powerful grip over the area put yourself in that culture in that time remembering that if you didn't worship the emperor you were sort of on thin ice but certainly if you proclaimed a different king then you were in big trouble put those two things together what did the israelites anoint with oil who did they anoint with oil if you think back to the old testament who did the israelites usually anoint with oil kings right so what they are saying when they are saying well they weren't saying christian but that that word translated to christian is are you of the party of the anointed king of Israel? Sound much like Christian today? Nothing like it, does it? You ask a Roman leader, are you of the party of the anointed king of Israel? They're going to be a bit uh, reticent in agreeing with that. Christian meant something deeply political. Not, no, don't think party political. Don't think Palmer United or Greens or anything like that, please, right? But it meant something deeply political and incredibly spiritually important. It held more clout within the life of the person, more, uh, far more to lose within the life of the person than what the word Christian does today. And it was, when it was originally translated, it was transliterated, which means they just got the Hebrew letters and kind of matched them with the Greek letters, which isn't really a translation because it doesn't give the meaning of that word. But when they started using Christianos, it meant the anointed king of Israel. But this was not the king that many of them were waiting for, right? Jesus said very clearly, you know, I'm not here to take this kingdom by force and to bring in this this new world of wealth and and Jewish rule again. Certainly in the gospel today we get that idea. And it's extremely important that we had a reading from Revelation today. 
How many of you have read Revelation and think you've got it? Bam, like that. It's great. It's good. Understand it? You read it from front cover to cover. It's very easy to understand. Uh, that's why Martin Luther tried to get it kicked out of the canon. He wasn't a big fan of it. <laughs> but the, I think the people who compile, compiled the lectionary for today and I, have done an excellent job. Because Revelation, or the Apocalypse, or whatever you want to call that book, vision, is a symbol in symbolic work which is critiquing the Roman Empire of the time and saying Christ will win out. It's a letter to the churches. If you, you can put the symbolism together quite well. It's a letter to the churches saying, look, don't give in, don't fall into this empire way of thinking. Remember who is at the heart of everything we do. Remember who is the king. Because this oppression will not win out, Christ will. And we've got all this fantastic imagery around it, which gets that point across. But also, it makes it possible to communicate this, uh, this message without those receiving it being arrested and put to death because it's political. Right? Genius stuff. Extremely powerful stuff. So friends, we can, we can see things or read things at times and misunderstand uh, the power or the import of what it is because of the way it looks to us or the way we've been taught it. Like our little Charlotte, I don't know where she's gone, right? She's a beautiful little thing, right? Lovely, always wants hugs, don't you? Yeah, wants to make people laugh, likes to dance. But you know that little Charlotte... She put down her first one-on-one jujitsu uh, opponent the other day. She's powerful. She's mighty, right? She loves it. But you'd never know it by looking at her, right? It's the same with our words and our symbols at times. And especially when we've got 2,000 years, uh, it's easy for us uh, to, to lose the import of what they have to say. So, Jenny, are you able to put that first picture up on the... I deeply insulted the person this morning who put this picture here. You'll never forgive me. The first, the very first one, if you can. It's the first slide. If you can't, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just describe it in great detail. There it is. Look at that. Fantastic. So I looked at that and I thought, and again, I apologize. My first thought was, which 1950s Sunday school book did you pull that out of? <laughs> you've got, you've got uh, Frank from down the road is Jesus. Right? Nice white trim beard. Beautiful. You've got the English king crown on him. And he's looking over the world. But you know what? It's good that that shocked me and I was challenged by that. Right? Because we all have... We all have our own preferences and ways that we see things, but this is a legitimate way that people see Christ the King. And there are ways we can read into this symbolism, which can be helpful and useful, right? Of course, Jesus would never wear a crown like that, right? I don't think his robes would have been that clean. However, white was used as a symbol of purity and of divinity. People weren't saying we literally think Jesus wore white robes like that. It's a sign of how pure and holy he was. And the idea of Jesus looking over the world really is a sign of Christ's deep, deep care for creation. And we don't think that Jesus literally wore a gold crown or would ever want to do that because he wouldn't. But it's a sign of how much he means to us. So friends, as a political reality to Christ the King, don't let politics become your identity don't be a person who's a card-carrying member of this political party, and that's some part of my identity, right? Because the first Christians did everything in their power to not become that, huh? to not be that, because they had Christ as the center of their heart. Don't let that build walls and barriers between other Christ followers. So that's sort of the political realm of it. Don't look, look at massive empires and boggle at how amazing they are or corporations or whatever. But there's a deep spiritual reality for each of us as well. The truth, the promise that Christ reigns in each and every one of our lives. Basiliah doesn't just translate to kingdom, it translates to reign. The idea that Christ reigns in our lives. That means we place importance 
on the things of utmost importance, like prayer, right? spending silent time in the presence of God, actually putting some time aside for it, of loving one another, trying to push past our differences. That can be really hard, right? And praying for those that we don't agree with. Uh, looking after those in the community who can't look after themselves. And understanding that no matter how far apart we may be, no matter how long ago somebody may have departed, we are still together in the community of saints. So friends, Christ blesses us with Christ's rule. Christ the King is a day where we can celebrate this as long as we understand how and why. And we can give great thanks that we, we are in this journey together. We're in this kingdom together and the reign is the reign of Christ, the merciful, the loving and the just. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer and sustainer. Amen.